On previous episodes of Tay Talk, we have talked about a Finnish true crime cases, such as the Oven murders from the 1960s and the Kytäjä murders from the 1970s. On this episode, we're going to talk about a young Kylikisaris murder from the 1953. Welcome to Day Talk, fellow talkers. And as I said, on this episode, we're going to talk about the disappearance and the murder of young Kylikisaari, one of the most infamous crime cases in Finnish history. And to help us out with this is a Miss Alexandra from Strike the Truth blog, who actually wrote two articles based on this horrific case. Hi! Glad to be here so we can talk about this very interesting and disturbing case. What intrigued you and inspired you to write these articles about this case? Uh, well, I wrote a part one and part two, a bit like we're doing today, because it's such a convoluted case with lots of details. Um, but what really interested me was the the fact that this was one of the first murders that really hit the tabloid news in Finland. So it was uh, publicized all over the country. And of course, a lot of people got involved and really cared about what happened to Kuli Kisari. And then as well, the suspects were very interesting characters. And uh, this is a good example of what happens when the media can just discuss anything and everything about the suspects and anyone involved with the case. Because yeah. a lot of people got accused and they weren't even involved. Yeah, and their identities were spread all over the media on that time. Yeah, yeah. I believe this case was so famous that even Finnish Yleisradio made a reporting or a TV broadcast of her funerals. Yes, her funeral was was televised on TV. And after that, there was even a movie done about the events. And then, of course, a lot of newspaper coverage, books. In fact, I can see you have the book there on your bookshelf. Teemu Keskisaari, a Finnish historian's book about Kyllikkisaari. Yes, I have sadly not finished it yet, but it's a really interesting book that I'm working on at the moment. Yeah, and even it's said that uh, the police have some kind of a crime museum that is close to the public, and there they have some artifacts from this case, like the stick, which we'll talk about, her scarf. This is really widely known case in Finland, and as you mentioned, uh, the media was all over it, and the suspects vary from the local pastor to even alleged KGB agents. But before we start talking about this episode, leave us a like by hitting that thumbs up button, hit also subscription button and the notification bell so you won't miss any of our future episodes. Also, leave us a comment of what kind of content would you would like to see in a future and what do you know about this case and its probable suspects. But now do the topic on our part one of the murder of Kyllikki Saari. Uh, Kyllikki Saari was a 17-year-old devoted Christian girl who never returned home from a church meeting that took place in the evening of 17th of May 1953. Can you tell us about what kind of a girl, woman, Kyllikki Saari was and how her final day that we know of went. Well, uh, first I'll talk about her kind of family and personality. So she was born as the second youngest child of Wilhelmina and Eino Saari, who were farmers from a little town called Heikila which is about 10 kilometers from Isoyoki. And she had two brothers and three sisters. 
So the they all helped with the farm, but Kuliki had a very bad accident when she was about 14. Um, she hit her head while she was cycling. And since then, she had really terrible headaches, so she couldn't do anything too physical. So that's why she got the chur- the job at the church. It was a clerical job, so, you know, she was sitting down for a lot of the day and just archiving. And she, she was a very happy person. People really liked her. Like, she wasn't troublesome. She wasn't rebellious. Um, she actually didn't like to socialize too much in terms of she didn't like to go partying, dancing, drinking. She wasn't interested in boys her age. She even told her friends that she was interested in marriage, which at the time was very strange because, you know, people of her age would get married and have children quite young. So that's why Kuliki just, you know, biked to school while she finished school. Actually, she was waiting to go to, I think it was a Seinayoki to start some kind of a secretarial college or something like that. But in the meantime, she was working in the church. She was going to church. She was mostly attending church events. So that's what she was doing on that Sunday when she disappeared. So on Sunday, 17th May, in the morning, first she went to church. And then around one o'clock, she came back home and she felt very tired. So she told her family that she will go to sleep for a while. Right. So how did she go to church? Like... Uh, I mean, like, I don't think she had a driver's license, been 17 years old, and in 1953, lots of people didn't have private cars. She used the bicycle. Right. Like she did all the time. Yeah. I guess people were then more used to biking, even the countryside from place to place, and the distances being villages and the actual cities that could be even in the Pohjama area, something like 10 to 20 kilometers were like quite normal bike rides like you said most of the places that Kuliki used to go was around the 10 to 20 kilometers mark right from her home so she knew the surroundings and her way around those places and used to bike everywhere Uh, she came home 1 p.m and she was tired and went to lay down do we know anything special about her mood or attitude on that day? Was it a, just a normal day for Kuliki, who you described to be a happy young woman? No, actually it wasn't. Um, she was very worried and quite anxious the whole day um, because in the evening she was supposed to go to this church devotional event. Um, basically, you know, all the young people gathered there and What she was worried about was coming home afterwards because the event would start at six and by the time it ended was around 10 o'clock. But she was happy that at the event would be her friends and one of them, Mayu, actually lived on the same path so they would be riding together part of the way. And actually at that same evening um there was a wedding and on top of that there was also another dance event where her sisters and brothers attended so Kuliki was quite scared that when she was biking home at the time maybe someone from that wedding would come and like harass her and Mayu or you know people got drunk they do stupid things so that also worried her Yeah, and we know for sure that that kind of like a harassment happens even these days. Like we said in the evening at 6 p.m., she went to this event, which was actually held at a school in Medicarvia, which is close to Isoyoki. Do we know the distance from uh, her farm to that place? I have heard some six to nine kilometers away from her home, but I can't pinpoint the accurate one. Yeah. 
Some sources say six, some say nine. So around something like 30 to 40 minute bike ride. Yeah, 40 minutes. So after she attended this event, she met her friends there. And like I said, one of them was Mayu. And at around 10 o'clock, they left and made their way home. Um, at this point, I would say, because I know that some people are asking, there has been several offers from her friends for Kuliki to spend the night at their houses uh, because her friends were aware that she was scared. So one of them was her friend Sirku, um, or Sirka. She asked her to stay and Kuliki said no. And also Mayu volunteered, but again, Kuliki said no because she was really tired and she didn't want to bike in the morning to home and then to her workplace. That's why she decided that it was better just to take a chance and bike home by herself. Would this have been like a normal behavior for her if she would have stayed over with some of her friends? Yeah, she often did that. Like I said, at 10 o'clock they left and then around 10.30 p.m. Mayu and Kuliki got to kind of a fork in the road so Mayu had to go one way and Kuliki had to go the other way. Once they got there, they said their goodbyes. And Kuliki said the last words that, you know, anyone heard her say, which was, I guess, no way to comfort her friend. If we translate it from Finnish to English, it would be something like, it will work because it has worked before. Bye, Mayu. Yeah, in Finnish, it, it went, um, I have a, direct quote here, I guess Maju testified for this. Eiköhän se tästä mene nytkin, kuten on ennenkin mennyt. Then they parted ways and from there she disappeared. Did Maju say anything about her state of mind? As we remember you mentioned that she was quite anxious and nervous on the daytime. But now she reassured Maju or herself maybe that it will work out uh, meaning the rest of the trip or the bike ride alone. Uh, did Mayu notice anything special? Yeah, she was really nervous. She was really worried, which for Kuliki was very strange because she was quite normally a very secure person and she wasn't afraid. So is there any theory other than that she might have been worried about the wedding guests on the region that she was so nervous about there is some theories that maybe she was scared of someone uh, because the previous winter something happened actually to her she was skiing home and uh, at some point in the journey something spooked her so badly that she went to the nearest home and called her father crying to come pick her up. You know, that that area was considered quite safe. Um, nothing really bad happened, like no murders or anything like that. So people thought that maybe she had a problem with somebody, not with just the general fear. Okay, then 30 p.m. they go their separate ways. Kuliki reassures herself and Mayu by saying that it probably will work out as before. And then they basically disappear in the night. We go to the next morning, the 18th of May. And uh, Kuliki should be working on the church. Yeah. Yeah, she was supposed to be there Monday morning. Right. So her parents haven't seen her at home. Not the whole evening since she left last last night to the church meeting. She didn't come home. She's not there in the morning. Well, her brother, I think he was Kalevi, the eldest one, did actually notice that she wasn't home the night, the same night. Because like I said, him and her sister was out at this dance that was happening on the same evening as the church devotional. So when her siblings came home, 
they noticed that her bike wasn't there and her shoes weren't there. But they decided that maybe she stayed with her friends because, you know, they, they knew she was worried. So the next morning as well, the parents thought the same thing, that maybe she stayed with her friends. Another option was that maybe she stayed at the church because that was also something she used to do. They didn't think anything bad happened straight away. Monday goes by, we go to Tuesday, and she still hasn't come home. The local church hasn't seen her either. No, that that's the thing, because the parish called the family and asked if Kyuliki was okay, why she hasn't come to work for two days. And that's when her parents realized that something terrible has happened and they contacted the police. How do these events go on from there? It's basically two days later, 17th being the Sunday, 18th being the Monday, and now it's Tuesday the 19th and the Sari family contacts the police. How? So from that point, uh, the police put out a call and because this is a very small community and people like to gossip, It's soon spread in the whole region that this young woman is missing. And, you know, Kyuliki, she was known, not very well known, like she wasn't a celebrity, but people have seen her in the church. So everyone who was worshipping in the same church knew her. And then, you know, the police started to get tips And witnesses started to come forward. And one of them was a man called Tie Yaska. That was his nickname. And he actually was the last person to see Kyuliki Sari alive. So it wasn't her friend who saw her last alive? No. This uh, man, so he was a local laborer. He worked for the road The, you know, the council maintaining roads and that kind of stuff. So he was biking on the opposite way on the same night at 10.40. He was slightly deaf and, you know, it was quite dark, but he is sure that he saw Kuliki or someone who looked like Kuliki around 10.40 biking the opposite way on that same night. So from that, the police deduced that Kyuliki was actually still going home. She didn't change her mind about going somewhere else. So then there was this uh, father and son that were delivering milk by horseback called Oskari and Vilho, and they came up to some unusual scene by the road. Can you tell us more about this? They passed the same road where Kyuliki went missing and they noticed there are some tr- tire marks from car and also from bicycle and there was a lot of gra- uh, broken glass and footsteps. So from that they kind of deduced or suspected that there was some kind of a fight or struggle and by that time they also heard that this young girl was missing so they tried to get to the police straight away i guess the police got good molds and uh, photographs from these <laughs> these traces i wish that happened but it being the 1950s everything was very slow so by the time the police got there everything was kind of gone because of the traffic on that road that's that's disappointing so Now we have a disappeared 17-year-old Kyle Kisari. We have an eyewitness who has seen her biking on the right direction, 10.40 p.m. And we have uh, alleged eyewitnesses of uh, who have seen some markings of struggle on the road, broken glass, tire marks from a bike and a car. And we don't have a body. And no. as far as I no. understood, this time goes by without any actual breakthrough. Well, about two months go until the next kind of piece of evidence is found. And 
That is found on 22nd of July. So at that point, a grandmother and her granddaughter are out picking berries in the forest close by to that road where Kiliki went missing. And they stumble across something shiny. So there was a bog there in that area where they were. And they spot something shiny and they realize that it's actually a bicycle that has been thrown in the bog. Um, so they kind of suspect that it could be Kuliki's bike. Because again, everyone in that area knew what happened. So they call the police and the police come and take the bike out. And they realize that, yes, it is actually Kuliki Sari's bicycle. From this event or this evidence, we can basically deduct that probably Kuliki didn't throw her bike herself into the bog. So there must be some foul play. She just didn't disappear in the thin air. Well, the interesting thing about the bicycle is that the saddle, you know, the seat was made from leather, but it was still in quite good condition. So it looked like the bicycle was just recently put there. And also the way it was put was actually quite smart because the perp, whoever threw the bike there, um, took out the tires so that there was no air. And he also kind of put it in such a way that it would sink faster into the bog. This is actually really interesting. You mentioned that the saddle was in such a good condition that it hasn't been there or hadn't been there for those two months that the girl was missing. And uh, as I remember from this excellent book, the police somehow scanned with metal detectors this book so they can definitively say that the bike hadn't been there for those two months as you hinted us there. Um, that's true. So after Kuliki disappeared, the police did a, a quite thorough search of that area, which included that bog, and they didn't find anything. So whatever evidence was found afterwards was added after many weeks to months of her disappearance. Definitely the perpetrator tried to hide and get rid of the bike for the area maybe that he knew that the police already had investigated. Yeah. So from that police thought that maybe was local, someone who knew the area and someone who also knew what the police has done. But still no body, right? Still no body. So the next piece of evidence was found in October. So at that point, the police said, okay, you know, Finnish winter is coming. That place would have been covered with many centimeters of snow for quite a few months. So police were prepared for that. So they decided that let's really do an, a more thorough search of that area again. Um, let's see if we find something. So that's exactly what they did. And, you know, it wasn't just the police at that point who was searching. There was also a search party made up of hundreds of volunteers because people were still interested to help the family to find out what happened to their daughter. So at that point, it was around 10th of October when they found something else. So what they found was Kuliki's shoe one shoe, and inside was a man's sock and her scarf that was tied up with a piece of string. These shoe things remind me of, and I might sound a bit tinfoil hatty here, but, and I don't mean to, but the shoe thing is peculiar because these shoes were, or one shoe was found elsewhere. And then in the 1960s, the bottom murders, the shoes of the victims were taken away and they were found further from the road of the actual murder site. Just, you know, just some detail that came to my mind here. So that's a good point that you made. But 
yeah, Skrillex shoes were found at different days and different places. But what they were able to deduce from the evidence that they found was that the scarf had bite marks. And that meant that maybe she was gagged with it. And then they were thinking this, this man's sock, maybe it's the perpetrator's sock. So it was a man's sock, not her sock. It wasn't her socks, it was a man's sock. On the next day, October 11th, the police continued their investigation and search on that book with the volunteers. What did they find on that day? Well, that was a very significant day in that this case, October 11th. So all the searchers, there was quite a few hundred of them. They made lines, you know, when police look for a body or effects of the person, they make those long lines and everyone goes forward to try to cover a big area. They did that and about a few hundred meters from the road where Kuliki Sari disappeared, they found a stick pointing straight up in the bog. You know, it looked strange that it was just sticking up like that. And they went to investigate and they found that this stick, once they pulled it up, was smelling of decomposition or like a very rotten smell. That's when they realized that's where the body was. Body of Gulikisari. Yeah. So this stick was the kind of a marker that the killer left either for himself to find the body again or for the police to find it. You suggest that maybe the murderer wanted the police to find the body. Later on, we'll see in the profile that that is an option the police are considering. So what is interesting about how this body was found, not only that the stick was placed there, but also how it was buried. So as soon as they found this place, the police imme- immediately cordoned off the area and started to dig up the remains. And what was interesting was that the body wasn't just buried. It was buried in such a way that the killer kind of dug almost like a door. There was like the earth was open on three sides and it was slightly lifted up. Then the body was placed in the hole and then this flap of earth was placed again down. So it looked like it was never disturbed. There was no signs of disturbance or digging. You know, if there wasn't that stick, nobody would have found this body. Okay, they found the body from the shallow grave from the book. They have found her shoes and some four months before they have found her bike. All of these things seems like they have been planted there after the 17th of May when she disappeared. Uh, what does the coroner and the police find while they are investigating her body? Like, what's the cause of death? Was she assaulted, you know, sexually? What's the story here? So, what to mention first is that when she was dug up, um, her brother Kalevi and her father were there to help pull up the body and identify her so that was really sad and the way she was found was also quite sad because her kind of upper torso one breast was exposed she had no lower body clothes or no skirt and no underwear she was fully exposed um her face was smashed so her nose was broken and her cheekbones were broken And her face and her top torso area were covered by her jacket in in such a way that the police kind of surmised that the killer didn't want to see her face. 
when he was killing or burying her. From that, we can deduce that Kuliki was probably hit with a blunt object. Something like a big rock or something very heavy and flat that could have damaged her face that badly. And because of the way that she was found with no clothes, they think that she might have been sexually assaulted but because the body was so badly decomposed, there was no way to kind of test that. Police were, were saying that probably she wasn't sexually assaulted, but there was no kind of way to completely confirm that. They just basically couldn't be sure what to make of it. Yeah, the only thing that they could say for sure was that she was not pregnant. And that will come important later. Um, and then that stick that they found, the reason why it was smelling so badly was because it was piercing her stomach. The autopsy happened on the same evening as her body was found. Um, like I said, they thought that her murder weapon was some kind of a club or a stone. So after that, a few more interesting things about this that I should mention is that the scarf that was found in Kuliki's shoe was actually belonging to her sister, Ali. It wasn't her scarf. But she had the scarf with her. She loaned it from her sister, right? Yeah. And also, one thing to mention about Kuliki was that she wasn't actually that small. She was about 62 kilos and quite muscular when she died. Kuliki was very sporty and she had very good arm strength and she was also quite agile because you know she was biking all the time she was in very good shape you know nobody could have really pushed her around that was a thin scrawny man and also a criminal profile was done of the suspect in this case and that profile was said that the murderer was a loner over 30 years old and possibly a local he was probably someone who was quite unusual or weird um someone who is probably antisocial, and because of the way that the body was disposed of and buried they think that he was somebody who received pioneer training in the army. Either when they did conscription or maybe at that point, you know, there was just a war happening. So could have been a soldier. And this wasn't the first murder that he committed because of the way that the evidence and the body was disposed of. Hmm. That leaves us to the suspects of the case, which we're going to talk about on the next episode of They Talk. So stay tuned for the next week. Hit like and subscription button and the notification bell so you won't miss the part two and many other episodes of They Talks. Bye.